Hello, my name is Ilse Rose and I'm a professor at Rudy Grodet School of Law and I will now um, give a lecture, online lecture, on the role and functions of the European Parliament. So, let us start by reminding you that the Lisbon Treaty, Article 13, defined the formal institutions of the European Union. Among these institutions is the European Parliament, but the European Parliament hasn't been an institution since the beginning, at the very outset of the European Community in the 1950s. So, when six founding members came together to establish European Coal and Steel Community, among supranational organizations at that time was high authority, corresponding nowadays the European Commission. At that time, to also balance the input of public, the civil society, they established assembly. So, in early days of European community, the European Parliament role was taken just by informal setup of just parliamentary assembly. And the European Parliament became a formal institution as from 1979 only. So the first elections in the European Parliament were 1979. So, I would like now to start my lecture by indicating that this lecture is recorded in the framework of the project carried out at the Riga Graduate School of Law, Jean Monnet Chair Project. So, what is the democratic role of the European Parliament. If we see the legitimacy issue of the European Union, uh, quite often we see the formulation of so-called democratic deficit. So what is democratic deficit and why can we speak about such kind of legitimacy gap when we speak about the European institutions? So, to discover this dilemma, we have to start by defining the European Union institutions with respect of their representation. So, who is represented through the, each of the institutions? So, we know from the previous lectures that in the European Commission, actually the whole general interest of of European Union, so of all 500 million people, is represented. So this is supranational body representing general interest as from all the uh, countries and inhabitants in these countries. So the Council of the EU and the European Council, these two institutions would represent the governments, the national governments' interests. So, and now speaking about the European Parliament, we have to indicate that the European Parliament is the only institution where people directly are represented because also of the election pattern. So, European Parliament, the members of the European Parliament are elected directly by citizens of the EU. So the citizens, let me remind, the, the Maastricht Treaty in 1993 defined the concept of European citizenship, so meaning that each individual having a passport of one of the nationalities of the European countries, at the same time also is a citizenship holder of the European Union. So the citizens of the EU member states are also automatically European Union citizens. So speaking now about this democratic representation, the functioning of the European Union 
shall be founded on representative democracy. And this is also the cornerstone among the institutional setup so that citizens are directly represented at union level in the European Parliament. And it is said in Article 10. So let's move to the next slide, explaining, well, if citizens are directly represented, meaning that they have the right to elect, but also responsibility to elect European Parliament, it's not only um, that they have this democratic possibility, but also it is their democratic responsibility. So there is quite often also a discussion about how often we would consider the mandatory election, a mandatory compulsory voting to be a right thing to do. So we know that in a couple of countries in the EU, the voting is mandatory, meaning that before the elections, either they are the national elections or they are European Parliament elections, participation of all the voters in these countries is mandatory. So I, I, in my slides, I just show you quite an interesting you know, illustration um, of the global map where we see that actually in uh, 26 countries around the world um, the voting is compulsory, meaning that the countries have during their elections uh, the, the voters, if they would avoid their democratic rights, so they, they get either fees or some other um, you know, punishment on, on uh, not fulfilling a democratic uh, uh, opportunity, democratic possibility to be participating in the decision making for, for the future policy makers. Uh, so this is up to, of course, we can um, at this um, moment uh, here actually trigger a new discussion. What would you think is a right thing to do? Would you support this um, uh, option of mandatory voting, fulfilling your democratic rights, or it should be optional? But at any case, so the democratic participation is also indication uh, of the civil society's engagement. And uh, when the European Parliament elections were first held in 1979, so the engagement or turnout uh, was quite high. There were 63% um, of, um, of population um, European citizens were voting, uh, participating in European Parliament elections. And then we know that European Parliament is elected every fifth year. So the term of the European Parliament is five years. And next elections, 1984, so the turnout figure was dropped down to 59%. So the turnout was much lower. And then with each year, as you see from the slide, each year the turnout went down and down and down and in 2014, when we had European Parliament elections in 2014, so this dropped to 40% only. So compared now, if we started at the level of 63% and dropped down to 40%. And this is quite an alarming trend. So if we go back and actually to the discussion uh, whether participation in European Parliament elections is our right or our responsibility. So can we actually see it rather as responsibility? Because European Parliament later 
would act on behalf of European citizens in its legislative function or other functions, budgetary function or supervision function. So actually there is a quite a direct accountability link. So European Parliament would be accountable for its policy and its output. So this democratic output uh, to its voters. So the lower the turnout, the less representation is actually reflected. So only 40% of Europeans are represented because 60% stayed at home. And of course in 2014 we saw it as a quite an alarming trend when I explained to you that through the treaties the European Parliament was made as only institutions where people are represented directly. So it's a supranational institution, but it is directly elected. So there is this accountability link, very clear accountability link of direct democracy. And what do we do now when we have uh, the, you know, every single treaty has increased the powers of the European Parliament quantitatively but also qualitatively and we will speak about it during the lecture. At the same time the engagement by people to go for it, to support this institution, to, to express their voice through this institution has gone down. So and after 2014 there has been a lot of discussions on um, you know how to explain um, Europe and European project in the member states, how to deal with the concerns of uh, the member state citizens, and how to uh, communicate European project better. So the, all this, um, including also um, the fact that uh, the, the future of Europe to some extent also became the, the issue very much discussed in um, member states as domestic policy issue, like take France, uh, where there was quite a strong anti-European mood um, before um, the uh, presidential elections. And uh, let's say um, what happened also in countries, some Eurosceptic countries in the Netherlands, where right-wing parties also sparked all the discussions, and it all went hand in hand with the referendum on, um, in, in London, in the, in the UK, uh, so where um, uh, the United Kingdom, through the referendum, decided to trigger Article 50, withdrawing from the European Union. So the issue of future of Europe, the future of um, legitimate representation of people, for what, uh, how can we explain a European project at home? Uh, so how do we deal with this democratic deficit and with legitimacy gap? So this all also triggered more and more discussions in Europe. And now, just to add um, the new figure here, we have the, the, the recent European Parliament elections 2019. So, um, just to mention that finally the trend went up. So it has been also decreasing and decreasing from uh, 79 to 2014 and finally so we broke this trend and in 2019 elections turnout went up to 47% of uh, the population, which is still quite low if we still um, remember European Parliament being such an important institution in lawmaking. So my next slide now um, indicates the um, uh, differences in turnout across Europe. As you see, I already indicated that some countries have mandatory voting. So here we have in Belgium, 88% of, um, of citizens voting, uh, taking part in European Parliament elections. 
But then we also have uh, countries uh, like uh, Croatia, Slovenia, Czech Republic, Slovakia, uh, where this um, turnout number is below 30%. So we, we have to see this. Look, at the one hand, it's good that the figure, average figure, went up. At the same time, we still have countries where the turnout was still very low. Um, so in Latvia, it was 34%, uh, which is increasing as compared to previous elections. Uh, but nevertheless, there is a lot to do uh, with regard to explaining the European project. So now let me turn to how people see European project when they go to elections. So this is the institution, European Parliament being institution, where people are directly represented and where the concerns are directly represented. So what are concerns of European citizens? And um, before the European Parliament elections, the, a lot was discussed. So there were, you know, think tanks and, and also um, researchers covered the European elections, the European Parliament elections across geographical but also thematical scope. And now let, let us spend a couple of minutes speaking about themes, about thematic scope of people, people's concerns when going to European Parliament elections. And again, the question is to what extent the European project can respond to these concerns. And here is a very, very interesting picture. So we see in the map, uh, according to the colors, the different concerns by people. Uh, so majority of concerns grouping, you know, around south east um, direction here across the map are devoted to economy and growth. So people are concerned about their future, about their future welfare. And this is before COVID. We are speaking about the European Parliament elections in 2019. So this is a mood uh, which was in summer um, or, or year before, but also the elections were held in May. Uh, so 2019 mood. So economy and uh, and uh, welfare is number one. Then there was a very strong concern on actually migration. So we are after the uh, the peak of the migration uh, influx of from from um, third countries to Europe, which was actually 2016. But 2019, we see the southern uh, countries, so the group um, on the map um, on, on the south part of, of, um, uh, of the European uh, continent, um, we see countries like Spain, Greece, Italy, Malta. In these countries, increasingly migration being a, a very strong, strong concern. Um, and then, very interesting, actually, um, conclusion from this graph is a climate discussion. So this was a year uh, when the awareness about the European Union becoming a leader in climate policy, responsible leader. Um, and we see actually uh, the welfare countries, so countries who have quite high economic growth and uh, GDP ratio, so countries like Denmark, like Sweden, uh, Netherlands, uh, so these countries were climate champions. So, and then of course issues like external borders and also social protection, but in some cases also internal security, so terrorism, where we have had some really bad experiences in Europe. So, and finally, youth unemployment, which goes very closely hand in hand with the economic growth. So when we see this map of different concerns by people, 
So politicians have quite a high responsibility to match their campaigns, their pre-election campaigns, with these concerns so that they can be credible in their campaigns. And we also have to think about Lisbon Treaty and about the division of competences, but not, because not all issues can be or should be solved at the EU level, including like social protection, which is actually the national competence and should be dealt with at, at national level. Um, and uh, interestingly also security and defense was very high on agenda. At the same time also here uh, the Europe has common foreign security and, um, and foreign policy and defense policy is quite an intergovernmental um, way of decision making. So where the Commission and the European Parliament has limited role in uh, defining the future policy in these fields. But at the same time, I also explain that the uh, pre-election time has sparkled a lot of um, um, political movements, anti-European pol 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 um, political movements, some of them being uh, right-wing, some of them being clearly populistic, and, um, and the European Council of Foreign Relations, uh, they made quite an interesting also research on uh, with respect to anti-European parties. Uh, when we compare the pro-European parties and anti-European parties, what were the main uh, agenda uh, of pre-election themes for these parties? And we see clearly from uh, the slide that for the pro-European parties, for those who were seeing Europe as solution, uh, you know, the climate change is very high, the economic crisis is very high, and also countering nationalism. So the values of Europe, the values on which European Union project is based, very high on agenda of these pro-European countries. And if we take anti-European parties, so the populist parties, so for them the main topic for their campaign was migration, so this, this mood which was, uh, which actually formed in countries, well, anti-migration mood, uh, serving very well for the campaigns of populistic parties before the European Parliament elections but also Islamic radical, radicalization and also economic crisis. So um, there was the protest against the existing policies, but also not only European policies, but also domestic. So in many countries, the uh, populist parties were playing also with the European issues against their domestic opponents. So uh, this all happens mainly in 2019, so after uh, um, the European Parliament has been elected, so um, to some extent this discourse has calmed down and also uh, now with the Brexit negotiations ongoing, the parties that were very much um, basing their policies against European Union membership, against also uh, deeper integration, um, they have learned how actually difficult it is. Um, and, and you know, you, the Brexit is definitely loose, loose project for both for Britain and for Europe. So the countries now that spoke about a Nexit, like Netherlands and Brexit, Greece, they are now, these rhetorics have stopped uh, because people have realized, in the, the parties have realized also the benefits of the European project. So now um, we have to speak about once the European Parliament um, members are elected, what is the composition of the European Parliament, how does it work and what does it deliver? So, to start with, the Lisbon Treaty indicated that the size 
of the European Parliament will be limited, even if there will be next enlargement. Uh, so the uh, size is up to 750 MEPs, members of the European Parliament, and the minimum number, so the threshold, even if the country is as small as Malta is, is six, six, uh, six members of the European Parliament. So maximum is 96, minimum would be six. Altogether, 750. And if we add the President of the European Parliament, so we get the number 751. So this is then uh, the uh, current number of the European Parliament. We will speak a bit later about the, um, the Brexit, about what actually happens after uh, the Brexit MEPs, um, the, these vacancies of the um, British um, um, members of the European Parliament leave. So the term uh, of the European Parliament is parliamentary term is five years, and uh, the um, Parliament internally elect the president. The president of the European Parliament currently is Italian, mm -hmm. David Sassoli, who is also representing. A, it's very important which political wing, which political group, um, the president would present and the current president presents socialists and democrats he will now uh, spend his term it will not be five years term after two and a half years this will be reconsidered so either he will be prolonged or a new uh, president will be elected within the european parliament so it's also important when we speak about the the structure and the numbers and, um, and the composition of the European Parliament, it's important to point out that the European Parliament has uh, two locations, two, two seats. So the, uh, one of them is the main building is in Brussels, where also the administration is located. Um, so where the committees and, and all the you know, functioners of the European Parliament administration work. But then there is um, also a plenary hall, which is in France, in Strasbourg. And the fact that the European Parliament is commuting between these two uh, locations, so they would go on the Thursday plenary sessions, uh, they would travel to Strasbourg once a month, um, uh, 750 parliamentarians with their staff members, uh, which of course is quite an administrative burden, also financial burden, but uh, this has been agreed uh, when the European Parliament was established and this was also conditions set by France so that uh, the countries that were founding members of the EU, of the European communities, would get some of institutions located in their countries, so we, like Belgium and Luxembourg, you know, Germany has European Central Bank. So, and it is also written in the Treaty of Lisbon. So, even though this is very much discussed, even among European Parliament members themselves, um, unless we open the treaty and reconsider this, this will remain as, you know, as a, a condition um, agreement also set up in the Lisbon Treaty. So the location of the European Parliament in two seats uh, being in Brussels and Strasbourg. Now I would like, speaking further about composition of the European Parliament, to explain you how uh, is the calculation of the seats per member state managed. So how do we know? Uh, we know that the minimum is 6 and maximum is 96. But, well, how many seats Latvia will get? How many seats Lithuania or Sweden will get? And this is uh, the, um, the calculation of, of seats um, is 
correlated to the population size. So the statistical data is taken um, to calculate um, the, uh, the share, the, the weight of the country with the seats in the European Parliament. And, um, and this is also quite a political you know, discussion when uh, the distribution of seats have been discussed within um, uh, General Affairs Council before uh, the changes of treaty and um, so at any uh, level of changes whenever the changes happen. Uh, so very much discussed issue about uh, each country of course wants to have more uh, power through the European Parliament. Um, and therefore you see in the slide here that distribution of seats has changed from the, um, from the Treaty of Nice uh, where uh, it was only 736. And then, uh, as I explained, the European Parliament gained more and more power. So the fact that from Treaty of Nice with 736 seats, it was now increased to 751 is already, you know, qualitative, qualitative change. So more seats uh, for the European Parliament members. Um, and so this distribution is across the member states' population and can be changed. And one of these changes took place with withdrawal of the UK uh, from the European Union. So the United Kingdom according to Lisbon Treaty calculations, have 73 seats. And of course now, uh, when Britain leaves, the 73 seats are weakened and uh, there was internal agreement among the member states that 27 of these weakened British seats would be distributed to other countries. Uh, whereas remaining 46 will, give, will be kept um, as a reserve for the future coming potential enlargement. And this is quite a telling, you know, signal for future enlargements because the seats are already there, so uh, we, the Euro European Union is ready to enlarge and members of the European Parliament seats haven't been fully distributed uh, to all member states, but kept in two groups. So balancing the, uh, the differences of power, for example, Estonia got additional one seat after a British withdrawal, not Latvia. But, but um, again, um, so there is also a link to the European Parliament website where you can visit this and see redistribution of seats uh, after, after the Brexit. So, we have discussed the structure, the, the setup of the European Parliament as an institution. Now, I would like to go deeper into this institution and see how it is set up with respect to individu individual politicians. Uh, so we know that 750 members are elected and I have just randomly picked one. And uh, what I want to show you that each of the European Parliament members um, has at the same time the political affiliation being a politician but also at the same time is affiliated with one or several of the committees. And this is very important because this will explain also the legislative work of the European Parliament, because the politicians will act in thematic committees. And it's very much comparable to national parliaments, when politicians also group in uh, the committees according to their uh, professional affiliation, so they form a like, budgetary commission, foreign affairs commission and so on. Uh, so I have picked here one example, um, a female 
politician from Latvia, Sandra Kalniete. So she is representing um, in, in, in Latvia a party, which is also when she was elected, uh, the um, party uh, called uh, Jana Vienuatiba. And uh, so this national party has been affiliated with one of the ideological groups in European Parliament. Uh, so when there are left-wing parties, they are affiliated with left-wing um, ideological groups. When there are liberal parties, they, they would be affiliated with liberal ideological groups. And here we have um, this party, Latvian party, uh, which expressed in European political groups is then the group of European People's Party. So that the policy of this national party is very close to the values represented by an ideological group, European People's Party, uh, partly also representing Christian Democrats. So, when we see further the profile of this parliamentarian, so apart from being an EPP group member, this member of the parliament also sits in four different committees. So she's member of AFET committee, the Committee of Foreign Affairs. She's member in INGE committee, the special committee for fair interference in all democracy processes, uh, including disinformation. She's also active in delegation to the EU and Ukraine parliamentary cooperation and also um, another delegation to Euronest Parliamentary Assembly. So these are thematic responsibilities. And also she has um, a you know, second role in several uh, other four uh, committees of internal trade and security and defense and so on. So each politician at the same time also works within one of these thematic committees. So, then I present to you the list of all possibilities that they can engage with. Uh, so, the foreign affairs, development, international trade, just to name some of them. So, also legal affairs, regional development, transport, industry, environment, and so on. So, once um, the European Parliament members are elected, they also gain this chapeau, this affiliation with all, one of these thematic committees or several thematic committees. Well, we have covered now the thematic part. Let's now go to political part. So each parliamentarian is a politician affiliated with one of the uh, European uh, Parliament ideological groups. And here um, in the slides um, I offer you the results of the 2019 elections so that the largest political group, the winner, uh, gaining most of the votes of the European citizens was the European People's Party. Uh, then followed by Progressive Alliance of Socialists and Democrats, and then followed by a group called Renew Europe. Former, the name was ALDE, so liberal, liberal, uh, classical liberalists. And then, um, they would, let's see, these are three larger groups, and then other groups would be Greens, um, uh, then Identity, uh, and democracy group, which is a right-wing party, also including those populistic movements of the pre-election campaigns. And then we have a large group, or had a large group, of European conservatives and reformists. And in this group, mainly the, the, the largest share of all the members were from the UK, so with the UK now withdrawing, this group is now much, much smaller. 
And then we have also European United Left um, Party, which is to some extent affiliated with socialists and, and even really um, left wing parties. And uh, we have uh, so called like hard Eurosceptics, which is Europe of freedom and direct democracy. And we have 42 of these members, which is quite a large share of Eurosceptics being in a very pro European project. But as said, this is all about representation, and we can criticize the Eurosceptics actually. Uh, legislating laws uh, that are binding for European citizens. At the same time, it's also representative democracy and even each groups have to re represent it also on the level of the European Parliament. So, um, when we see now uh, the graph of the uh, distribution of political uh, groups in the European Parliament, so we see that actually the major political groups are S and D, Renew Europe, and EPP. So no particular order, but these are the largest groups. So if they agree um, on amendments, so there is already a large um, a majority uh, support for 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 legal act to be passed. I will explain about this legal work a bit later, but now some slides on um, how the member states are distributed across different political affiliations. And this is quite an important aspect of European uh, politics and European decision making, because the governments and government coalitions, if they represent, you know, either liberal coalitions or social democrat coalitions, or they represent, um, um, you know, EPP uh, affiliated coalitions, uh, so they would definitely also be willing to cooperate with other like minded governments from the same political family. And um, in the slide you see the also from the European Council uh, on uh, Foreign Relations source that, uh, for example, in EPP group uh, we have countries like Germany, um, there we have um, um, Ireland being there, um, Latvia is there. So the countries, EPP uh, politicians before, and also Croatia, they meet before uh, the high-level meetings when the pre prime ministers travel to Brussels. It may be very often that they would have their EPP event, either the dinner, informal one, or breakfast, or some kind of exchange of views within their political group to see actually the balance of power, where the deal may go. Um, so, of course, it is very important to be part of a powerful group. So, EPP being a leading political group in Europe now, also this coordination among leaders is a very important one. And here I have also to mention that Latvian Prime Minister is a very outspoken uh, you know, member of this EPP um, internal uh, informal coordination. Uh, so, in many cases, also uh, being a spokesperson. In particular, I want to remember the nomination of European Commission uh, President. So, indeed, uh, it was also our Prime Minister of Latvia um, gaining this coordinating role uh, for this uh, very, very demanding task of coordination. So, we have uh, in the Liberal group, Renew Europe group, we have countries like France, there is also Netherlands um, uh, and Estonia. And you can see that after elections, of course, this can change. So, if you would watch this slide uh, in coming years, so possibly you would find countries already in a different uh, political group, because coalition may change. Um, now, my next slide explains that uh, the political 
the shift of political power is happening um, um, all the time. Uh, so in the early 80s, uh, there was um, uh, predominantly uh, social democratic governments in Europe and by the mid 90s so social socialists and democrats were the larger uh, largest uh, political party in the european parliament political group dominating but then the trend changed so uh, as from the end of 1990s uh, so the european people's party took over and became stronger compared with social democrats and now this uh, European People's Party dominance has been there, uh, you know, in the last uh, 20 years at least, uh, even more. But then uh, the question is uh, whether the other political families possibly come in with their powers. And we, sh we see partly also in 2019 elections that uh, French uh, presidents also strong personality and a driving force behind this Renew Europe political group also made this quite a, a, a competing political power, a new, um, a new um, uh, change possibly also uh, of the power balance uh, so that there were not any more any grand coalition as in 2014, when two major political groups actually could agree on any um, issue. So now uh, the composition is much more fragmented, uh, but the predictions before the European Parliament were uh, indicating that even more um, uh, populist parties would gain power, which was not the case. So that uh, I think that in everyday life of the European Parliament, um, voting patterns, um, uh, we can still see quite a strong uh, dominance of, of three um, uh, major parties. But let's be uh, very open-minded on this, because I think also we have climate agenda, where Greens play a strong role and so on. So this is a very interesting a political um, dimension is a very, very important part. And uh, just to mention, and my next slide shows the, um, the po po political affiliation of the President of the uh, European Parliament, uh, it is also changing patterns. Some, in some five years we have had uh, uh, Social and Democrats, others it was uh, EPP, um, quite seldom there was a liberal a representative of the liberal group. But in particular, when there is election of um, the large, um, uh, important election of the leading positions in the European Union, the European Commission President, European Parliament President, the new High Representative, the European Council President, so then the political affiliation is one of the balancing factors. So then they take into account geographic distribution, political affiliation issue, also gender balance, but also, uh, yeah, uh, to some extent also the country that entered, I would not call them new member states anymore, but countries uh, entered the EU after 2014. So, Political aspect is very important in this balancing exercise. Now, um, let's get to powers of the European Parliament. So, European Parliament is and has been very powerful in terms of legislative work, in terms of its budgetary functions and in terms of its supervisory role. And uh, in my next slides, I will explain each of these aspects. But here, um, let me just focus on some aspects of supervisory role. So, meaning that the balance of institutions is very important, so that the European Commission, Council of the EU and the European Parliament would always be balanced. There is no one institution that would start dominating. So we are balancing general interest with 
government, national, member states' interest, but also with citizens' interest. So this is triangle balancing. And in this balancing act, the European Parliament has a strong role to play because it approves the appointment of the President of the Commission. So it is the Parliament that actually gives a vote after the European Council has um, elected through the qualified majority voting their nominee and then it would be the final word by European Parliament. Uh, the same applies also to commissioners, so we have 27 member states commissioners, but these commissioners have to undergo a scrutiny, so the hearing at the European Parliament, uh, which sometimes may take two hours, uh, asking questions on the future vision, on the, um, on the roadmap of the policy making, on the very concrete proposals, how the uh, the, Europe, the European Commission uh, nominee uh, would solve this or that problem with the European uh, the, the, the means that treaty uh, provides. So and are only after these hearings uh, the commissioners can take post and it's quite uh, now in, in several cases um, in particular 2019, uh, there have been also a um, situation when the member state has to replace a candidate because the European Parliament has rejected the candidate after these hearings. So also that the, uh, the most important power is that according to the treaties, uh, the European Parliament actually can dismiss the whole commission. And uh, historically, there have been some precedents, uh, some mismanagement in the Commission, uh, which uh, was very close to the European Parliament um, and would exercise these powers. Now, um, let me now continue with the, um, with the role of the European uh, Parliament as a legislator. So, as a legislator, European Parliament acts on behalf of the citizens of the European Union, not the member states. So, in my slide I'm asking the question, uh, would you think that the voice uh, of, um, of uh, the European parliamentarians would represent uh, the countries they, they were elected from, or they would actually represent their political um, course, they affiliated by, by this political family. And um, indeed, um, they are representing their political uh, family, They're, they vote in line with the uh, with a pattern of other MEPs in the same group, but there are cases where the member states have um, uh, very strong uh, preferences, very strong positions, uh, where there is internal agreement among the MEPs of the same country to vote in the same way, but this is then really exceptional and, uh, and then uh, this, these issues are, are yeah, they may be um, politically sensitive or financially very sensitive to the member states. Uh, so th this is not a, a you know, modus operandi uh, averagely as, as, as an average, but this would be then exceptionally uh, agreed among the parliamentarians. So, um, when the European Parliament gets its legislative function, then the European Parliament, according to Lisbon Treaty, uh, would um, exercise these powers through three different procedures. And in my next slide, I explain that actually there are two, two large group of these procedures, so there are grouped in special legislative procedure and ordinary legislative procedure. So by its name, ordinary means that this is a legislative procedure by default. So normally uh, the 
legal um, legal um, proposals are agreed between two legislators, the, the Council of the EU and the European Parliament. And in this ordinary legislative procedure there are three readings and uh, we, with my next slides I will explain how this works. Uh, but it is now applied to approximately like 85% of all legislative work um, in the EU is under this procedure. So ordinary legislative procedure previously called co-decision. So here the parliament can amend. So in, in these readings the parliament uh, in these committees can come up with the proposal that they would add to the legal act uh, as amendment and then um, they interact with the European um, Union Council um, in getting full agreement either in first reading or in second and if it doesn't work then third reading but no more than three readings. So um, this was one most important procedure where the European Parliament is involved. So the second procedure where actually the power of the European Parliament has very much increased is the, how the European Parliament adopts international agreements. And here the procedure is called consent procedure, which means that the European Parliament approves the whole text, but they can also veto it as a whole. They cannot amend but then they have also right to actually to reject uh, the proposal. And here the European Parliament has a strong, really strong role to play. Uh, this is how they work with the accession agreements, with enlargement. This will also be a procedure with the Brexit. So the Brexit procedure where the European Parliament is gauged by consent, so they cannot open the text and add something, but they can either agree or reject it. Um, and it gives European Parliament a very strong political standing. So the other institutions have actually to do their best and to cooperate in advance to be sure that the Parliament consent will be delivered. And finally, a less um, um, in, um, quite rarely uh, used procedure, consultation procedure, still um, in place with some uh, common foreign secu security policy files and uh, with some files on, on taxes and so on, uh, where the parliament has power to give the opinion, but the European, uh, but the council can still consider it and continue on their own uh, possibly, uh, you know, um, having a different opinion. So there is no veto by the European Parliament. Now, uh, my next slide explains in details the, um, the way, how the ordinary legislative procedure works. And here, uh, as explained, we have these three readings. The ordinary legislative procedure starts uh, with the uh, proposal from the Commission, uh, which comes um, uh, directly is sent to the European Parliament and to the Council, and two institutions start considering the legal proposal text. So the first reading has started. So this actually happens in parallel. So both institutions are working in their offices, we know how it happens in the Council, where we have working groups, we have ambassadors, we have ministers. But in the European Parliament, the process would run with engagement of the so-called leading persons that are rapporteurs. So the, the name of the main chairperson on this dossier is rapporteur. Um, and uh, it's a very strong, um, you know, influential position. But it, as you know that each of MEPs has its also political hat to avoid that a politician from liberal group would start influencing the, the, um, the dossier only with 
his approach or her approach of uh, a political party. So there are so shadow rapporteurs. So shadow rapporteurs from other political groups would balance and avoid that the rapporteur would look only from one perspective. So this goes now also to different committees. If we just take an example of climate, so climate issue is environment, but also competitiveness, it's part three industry, but also consumer rights and so on. So it has to go to all these committees so that it goes politically, distributed across different political groups, but also in terms of thematic distribution. And then finally, uh, once these committees have considered the legal act proposal, uh, they would also now table some amendments and these amendments will be approved in this main thematic committee and now uh, submitted to the plenary for vote. So in the plenary in Strasbourg the vote would be then um, on the specific amendments by the European Parliament which are now um, through this process of the work uh, done before be tabled uh, for the first reading. And then if both of institutions are on the same page, if they agree, uh, the legal act is passed and it's ready. If not, it may happen that the European, the Council of the EU would reject the amendments made by European Parliament and said, oh no, it's going too, too far. So then the Council would actually respond uh, through the document to the European Parliament amendments, it will go now to the European Parliament for second reading. And if both institutions agree, then the legal text is adopted in second reading. But if not, it's sent with the amendments from the European Parliament, with their rejection and their additional comments, back to the Council. So it's like a football game between two institutions. And now, once it's sent back to the Council in the second reading, again, it may happen that Council decides just to pass it in second reading and adopt it. And in case it doesn't work in second reading, there is no need to go more and more rounds because there has been kind of clear differences between these two institutions. So that the solution would be just to bring them all around one table to sit together and discuss. And this third reading procedure is called conciliation committee. So conciliation committee would uh, then uh, consist of the Council, the European Parliament and the European Commission. So three institutions together. And if they agree, then finally in the third reading legal act is adopted. If they don't agree, so that the legal act actually ceased to exist and uh, this actually shows that uh, the differences in uh, opinions between institutions like the Commission, the Council, member state governments and member state citizens or political groups have been too diverse and there, there is no one single you know, outcome uh, on adoption of legal act. And then the Commission may, uh, with time, come back with a new revised proposal. In most cases, though, uh, the legal acts currently are adopted in, during the first reading procedure, which also increases the efficiency. Of course, we want Europe to be efficient, effective, to deliver. And uh, in order to do that, um, it's even so the first reading procedure is uh, very much welcome, but it also requires a lot of skills uh, from the council presidencies and in this co-decision um, there, if you read in the textbook also you would find the term trilogue. So the trilogue is actually informal consultations where the three institutions, Commission, Council of the European Parliament, would consult internally in order to reach this effective outcome and adopt uh, legal acts. So this was uh, um, my main 
explanation of the increasing powers uh, of the European Parliament. Uh, the European Parliament is a very, um, a very important institution uh, with um, balancing and dealing with a democratic deficit. Uh, so the European Parliament also is very much engaged in um, uh, cooperation and, uh, and dialogue with society. Uh, so uh, the European Parliament is very open to society. Uh, so if there are um, also uh, input from uh, NGOs or for civil society um, uh, business groups or interest groups, we see in front of uh, European Parliament building a lot of um, actually activity, um, lobbies going on there, demonstrations. So there is uh, a transparency list now uh, developed uh, in order to um, to make also this um, interest group lobby much more transparent so that the, the all um, different views in Europe in uh, delivering new legal acts are taken into account. Um, so with this I would like to end my lecture on the European Parliament. Thank you.